Jacob, you and I go back so many years. Until 1996, we interviewed every medical school dean in New York City. And I just want to launch Jacob by saying, each one of your degrees would have been enough for a fulfilling career. Yet, you went on further. A law degree from Harvard, a medical a degree from the Columbia uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons, an MFA from NYU, a master's from Brown, and from Columbia University. You've written mystery novels, short stories, ethics, and added to that, uh, you're a sightseeing guide. What are some of the influences that have made you into a Renaissance man? Well, I think the first thing I should point out is we interviewed all those medical school deans, and I would imagine most of them aren't there anymore. <laughs> and, and, and I'm still here. <laughs> So the trick is, if you do more than one thing, it's harder for them to get rid of you. <laughs> well said. Um, that being said, um, I think we, we had spoken earlier about my role at Brown teaching. An advisor who was a professor at Brown, who was a very significant influence on my life. And one of the things he actually taught me was that if you do more than one thing, um, the people who are employing you to do one thing don't know how you're doing the other thing, and they assume if you're doing what they're paying you to do poorly, you're doing the other thing well. <laughs> so if you do enough things, you can confuse enough people they think you're doing a good job. And that's sort of my strategy. <laughs> you have been so outstanding in so many different fields. What was it that motivated you to law school, medical school, writing, and different genres of writing? Well, I think a large part of what I do actually focuses on one field or one set of fields. Because a lot of the work I do is in bioethics, so it's not like I'm a trial lawyer on the one hand and I'm a neurosurgeon on the other. The legal work I do focuses on healthcare, on medical ethics. The medical work I do, the teaching of the medical students, focuses on ethical issues and clinical medicine. So it all, most of it at least, focuses on a similar set of areas that deal with human ethics, human values. And a lot of the writing I do too, even though it's fiction and primarily for my pleasure and sort of a, an aside or a hobby. Um, it's still focused on those same questions. I want to ask you a question about your early schooling. And I know that you were born in the Bronx, but you grew up in Scarsdale. Any special influences in the school among teachers or perhaps even your parents that enabled you to branch out into, into so many different interests and areas? A absolutely. I can actually say I had five different high school teachers who I kept up with for for those who are still alive, I do keep up with, and those who died until they died for 15 years after school, 20 years almost, um, who really reshaped my way of thinking, not just in high school, but long beyond that. Um, Werner Feig, who was my high school social studies teacher, um, was fascinated not just with what you did in the classroom, but how what you did in the classroom as an 11th grader could impact the world outside. And he was constantly trying to get you to write op-ed pieces or call the radio show. Um, he would always, he, he had a persona, Bill from White Plains, and he would call local radio stations pretending to be Bill, offering views on different issues. And that, that really resonated with me. Um, there's another teacher of mine who a project I worked on at the age of 17 is just starting to come to fruition. He actually doesn't know this. I'm going to meet with him for lunch in a few weeks and surprise him. Um, when I was 17, we had to choose a research project, an unsolved or unsolvable historical question. And mine was whether President Warren Harding's illegitimate child was really his illegitimate daughter or was an imposter. And in 1988 or 89, that was unsolvable. But now with DNA evidence, um, I am in the process of orchestrating testing of the heirs of Harding and the heirs of the daughter. So How fabulous. Now, did she inherit anything as an illegitimate daughter? Or was it, what were the legal just, implications? Just a bad reputation. <laughs> um, it's that there's no money at stake, there is just oh. pride in the sense that her descendants are very attached to her being a daughter, yes. and the descendants of Harding, or his collateral and nieces and nephews, and now great nephews, are somewhat resistant to having a new family member, sort of like the Hemings and the Jeffersons. Um, but they seem to come together, and hopefully we will resolve this answer within the next year. Now, why are you meeting with this teacher? Was he the one who launched you on so this? So, he had sponsored me in this project when I was 17 years old. And I determined at 17 I was going to solve it. Now at 38, hopefully I will. <laughs> That's a true. Listen, you've done a lot of things in between. I'm going to pass now to Adam on the telephone. Adam, would you like to ask a question or two? I, I would love to. <laughs> okay. And, uh, Jacob, what are your favorite 
Well, I'm going to repeat that for the camera. Adam asked on the telephone, uh, what are your favorite books and what do you like to read? Well, I think in terms of what I like to read, I primarily, I love reading short stories and I read a lot of contemporary short stories. So a lot of the writers I read are known to other writers and people who are avid readers of the best American short stories, but are probably not household names. People like Kevin Brockmeyer, Elizabeth Graver. I have a soft spot for doctors who are writers. Uh, maybe the sense of if they can do this, I can do this too. So for example, Ethan Kanan, who's a pediatrician at Harvard, is a wonderful short story writer. and I, I'm passionate fan of his work. He, he wrote a book called God's Grief, which is a story about a man who uses Walt Whitman to re reinvigorate the Civil War dead and bring them back to life. And I think it's a brilliant book that has really inspired me. I, I also like reading a lot of books related to human cognition and neuroscience and how we decide. For those of you out there looking for a good read, Jonah Lehrer's How We Decide is a great condensed book about the irrational nature of the human decision-making process. And I, I use a lot of what he used to say in my own treating of patients in psychiatry. You're adding to my reading list of about 25 books that I have to read, Jacob. Thank you for the onus. <laughs> well, I, I will give you one tip from his book, um, which some of your, your viewing audience may find valuable. Um, he condenses thousands of, of articles and literature uh, in the field of decision-making into a few key points. And one of them is people who buy their homes because they have a visceral sense that they like them end up much happier than people who buy their homes for some rational reason like if it's close to the train station, or uh, the driveway was the slope and I didn't have to shovel. The irrational reasons are the ones that make people happy in the long run. That's very interesting, actually. Uh, Adam, any other question at this point? The author, Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle, became best friends with Harry Houdini, the magician. Do you have any unusual friends and acquaintances? So I'm going to repeat that for the camera. Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's best friend was, one of his best friends was Harry Houdini. And the question has been asked, Jacob, do you have any unusual friends? Are there any Houdinis in your life? <laughs> well, I can certainly, I have a number of unusual acquaintances from the world of psychiatry, but I can't share who they are. Um, often they're not household names, but people with very odd traits or interests, like a man who thinks he's an animal. And I do get inspiration from these patients very much. Um, <laughs> That, that being said, I'm sure this man would not want me to share his name on these. <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, I, I, I will, uh, two people who've really influenced me who are reasonably well known, who I, I'm very close to. One is the playwright Sarah Rule, um, who very much inspired me to start playwriting. It's, we had a dare about 12 years ago now, um, right after she had won a MacArthur Fellowship, maybe 10 years ago, that if she wrote a short story, I would write a play. And I wrote 15 plays since then. I, as far as I know, she has yet to write a story. But it was a very powerful influence nonetheless. And the second one is, believe it or not, my summer camp baseball coach, a man named Jim Mason, who for 25 years was working on a book about the John Anderson presidential campaign. And nobody took it very seriously. He would dabble here, dabble there, do an interview. And recently, his massive compendium of the campaign that is probably the best political book ever written, and has gotten press to that effect, called No Holding Back, came out. And it was really very influential for me, seeing that someone could really devote half their life to such a, an important yet not well-documented subject and carve it out of the rest of their life, and hopefully I can do that with my own writing while I'm doctoring. Now, how old a man is he? He is... I'll be kind to him because I, he might watch this. I'm the far side of 40. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, who is it? Jack Benny, who was always 39? Oh, yes, that's me. <laughs> And uh, I'd like to pass now to Sybil. With bioethics, I, I understand you, you consider yourself a libertarian. Is that I would correct? say in the field of bioethics, I'm very much a libertarian, okay, which so I would distinguish from being a bio, uh, libertarian in, in the world of politics. Like I'm not, I'm not an advocate for the values of Ron Paul, I don't think it's on the post office, but I believe very much that there should be as few restrictions as possible on what people can do with technology in the field of medicine. Okay, so how, and I'm just curious, how? How does this play out in the career of a, of a bioethicist? Do you bring your own philosophy to it, or does a particular institution have a philosophy that you must adhere to, or do you try to influence an, an institution? How does that all work? Well, I think there are two things that ethicists do, and they're actually very distinct, distinct careers, and I, I do mostly one and some of the other, but we'll hopefully do both someday. 
One is as an advocate for ideas in the public sphere. And there, I have my own set of values, and I write in journals advocating for positions, and, and really trying to shift the window of what ideas are, are at the fore, and when other bioethicists draw on the consensus um, for making decisions in the hospital, they look to what their peers have said, and I try to shift that consensus toward the values I believe in. The second role one often has is an ethics consultant in the hospital, which I, I've done in the past, I've at Brown, I've done occasionally and formally at Sinai, and in those settings, you're not advocating for any theoretical position. You're trying to outlay for a family or for a clinician what the different options are. And there you really, to be honest and be uh, a fair provider, you have to show them what all the options are. You can't try to slap them in one direction or another. Jacob, once you had your bachelor's degree, and then you had a master's degree, then you had the master of philosophy degree, and you wrote this huge tome and you began writing, what made you want to go on for the law degree? And then after the law degree, the medical degree? Well, it's, I, my long-term goal was to be a bioethicist. And the problem is, unlike being a, I don't know, a trial lawyer or a cardiologist, there's really no path to being a bioethicist that is firmly established. It's not that you sit for the postal workers exam and they make you a postal clerk and then a letter carrier <laughs> and then you become postmaster general when you pass all the exams. So you sort of have to cobble it together. And one person says, you really need a law degree to do what I do. And someone else says, well, that's true, but to understand the science behind it, you also need a medical background. Um, my, my dream is when I have enough degrees, eventually they'll give me the job I want. <laughs> that, that, brings, that brings me to my next question. Where would you like to be 10 or 20 years even from now, what is your dream job? I was say, I'm hoping I don't have to get a PhD in economics or math in order to get where I want. <laughs> they haven't put that on my agenda, but um, I would love to be running a hospital ethics committee um, and doing clinical ethics consults, which is uh, a few major hospitals now have full ethics services. Columbia does, Cornell does. Um, Mount Sinai, even though it is a very strong ethics program, doesn't have the kind of ethics service where they do hundreds of ethics consults a year. So if I stay in Sinai, eventually I'd love to set something like that up. So it doesn't really exist in your perspective, in your opinion, the way it should be? Exactly. Okay. It's, and I will add, ethics services in the short run lose money because you have to hire someone to run one, you have to pay for the consults. In the long run, they save the hospital a fortune because if an ethicist comes to you on the fourth day, your terminally ill relative is in intensive care sits down and explains the options for end of life and tells them realistically, I've been a physician for 40 years and nobody in your relative's condition has ever survived. That family member may terminate care on day five or day seven and, and be happy with that decision. While without the ethicist, that family member may linger for 30 days or 60 days. The outcome will be the same. The family will suffer. And often the hospital will be foot with a bill for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I never thought of it that way. That's an excellent point. Is the role of the ethicist to provide constructive criticism in our society? In the public sense, yes. And I, I think it's important to distinguish those two roles. Family comes to the bedside and they say, we are devout Roman Catholics. We believe when there's life, there's hope. We never terminate or turn off a ventilator. I'm not going to say to them, I think that's a deeply misguided view. Um, give me your hand, let's pull the plug. But if I'm writing in the public sphere, I can say, suggest guidelines for when continuing a patient on a ventilator makes sense and when society might not choose to support that view or when society might not choose to pay for that view. Um, it's, if your prognosis is such that nobody in your condition has ever recovered, it might make sense to let you remain on a ventilator for a few weeks or a month to let your family adjust. It might make sense to let your family keep you on a ventilator forever if they're paying for it. It makes less sense for them to keep you on a ventilator forever if you or I or the taxpayers are paying for it. You have also expressed the view of the ethicist on abortion issues and other issues like that in society. And um, do you feel that those uh, opinions are truly opinions or are they based on some degree of scientific endeavor? Or research. Well, I think it's important to distinguish what is science from what is values, because we can, we should be all, all able to reach a consensus on what the science is. Um, we may not be able to do it today or tomorrow, but eventually there is a right answer to the science, um, or at least in, in a Newtonian world, not a quantum world, we can achieve pretty close to a sense of what the right answer is scientifically. 
but that doesn't tell us anything about what the right answer is values-wise. Right. What I try to teach my students when I teach bioethics is to advocate very strongly for the position they believe in, but recognize that people who disagree with them are idiots. That if you start with a different set of premises, you will reach a different set of conclusions. And even though I strongly favor reproductive freedom, I understand rationally why people who are opposed to reproductive freedom have the values they do. And far be it for me to say they're idiots or they're wrong, I just don't agree with them and wouldn't want to live in a society that has the rules they desire. And I think it's an important distinction to make. Because when you lose sight of that distinction, then you start sending people threatening letters or gluing their door locks or blowing them up. But, we, but the, the reality is we do live in a society where people have many differing perspectives and we do have to live with that. Absolutely. And I think one of the, one of the things we often lose sight of is the value of the rule of law. Um, I, I get a lot of threatening letters. Uh, I actually, one of my favorite stories in hindsight, which my students often make fun of me for when I tell them this, is a former student once sent me a case of champagne, but the way the case of champagne was packaged, one of the wires was sticking out, and it was right after George Taylor had been killed, and I had to call the bomb squad. I got this anonymous package with a wire coming out of it. And I had done a lot of work in the, in the public eye at that time relating to Taylor and related to reproductive issues. Um, so you are reminded both that we live in a very fragile civil society, yes. but also that the rule of law and the the recognition that other people who disagree with you will play by the same rules is very important in making our country work. Was the wire, a, 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 in reality, a dangerous wire, or did you get to drink the wine? Um, it was very dangerous if you drank the whole bottle. <laughs> Fortunately, I only took a sip, so. <laughs> very good. Out of my past to you. Well, this, no, this, this, is, this is fascinating. To me, one of the, one of the areas that really called out uh, is the cultural, you know, cultural aspects of uh, being a bioethicist. Because you're dealing with, you know, we live in a multicultural society, and you know, you're, you're dealing with people who may be from a different culture with different values and different norms. How do you deal with that? How do you work with that? Well, I think the first thing you have to do is you have to understand why someone believes what they do. Um, and one of the examples I use is the difference between Jehovah's Witnesses and Christian scientists. Jehovah's Witnesses turn down blood transfusions, or many of them do, because they believe that it impedes their ability to stand by the arm of God in the afterlife. But they believe blood transfusions work. They, they just don't believe they're ethical. Sort of like Orthodox Jews may admit that lobster might be delicious, but it simply violates their canon of rules to eat it. Christian scientists, on the other hand, turn down antibiotics for pneumonia because they believe it interferes with prayer that will save them. And they don't believe antibiotics work. They don't doubt the morality of the antibiotic but the efficacy of it. And I use those two examples is, one is an area where science has a right answer. Um, all of us will agree, I hope, certainly all the medical students I teach, that antibiotics cure pneumonia. And then the question arises, how do we deal with people who disagree with the facts of our world? Which is very different from a Jehovah's Witness, where they agree with the facts of our world, they disagree with the values of our world. And I think often in the public discourse, those two phenomena get blended together to the detriment of both clarity and the welfare of the people involved. Do you think the ethicist has the ability to really change and alter the path of circumstance? In the individual hospital level, absolutely. Um, I've seen, for example, a man I deeply admire is Ken Prager, who runs the ethics service at Columbia University. And he's a Orthodox Jew, I think in his late 60s, and he's a pulmonologist, and he's a certain gravitas to him. But when he comes into a room and says to the family, these are the options. But if you ask me what I would do if this were my mother, I would say the following. That carries an enormous amount of weight with people. And whether they follow his suggestion or not, they somehow can appreciate the good faith that he brings to things and the sincerity of what he's saying. And that will often reshape what people does, people do. Because what a lot of people do want when they see a clinical ethicist, they don't want to be told what to do. They want permission to do what they already planned on doing. So there are people who will say, you know, I really think that realistically my relative's not going to recover, they would never want this, but I don't feel comfortable just making a decision like this. But if you tell me it's ethically okay to do that, that it's within the realm of what reasonable people would do, that gives me comfort, or some would say cover, to make that choice. Do you think the words that have the greatest impact are, if it was my mother, this is what I would do, I think people respect or respond to that emotionally. Oh, I believe him because he said he would do this to his mother. 
I, I think it's, it's, it should be used carefully because it is a very powerful thing to say. Right. And I think in psychiatry, which is the field I practice, there's a strong effort to discourage people, I think, culturally, historically, for making that sort of statement. I do it often in practice. I feel like it's very helpful to say to someone, if you were my relative, I would suggest trying this medication. Or I would suggest not trying this medication. Because while they can't know for sure you would really do that, the very fact that you thought about what you would do for your relative yes. resonates with people. That they're not just a stranger to you, they're someone you actually care about. Right. You've had lots of education on both sides of the, the desk. You've been a teacher, you've been a student, you're an education newspaper. What have you learned about what is the most effective way to learn as a student and as a teacher? What have you discovered is... Um, well, my, my fifth grade teacher told us that um, Mark Twain had once said you uh, shouldn't let your schooling interfere with your education. And it was 25 years before I found out that Mark Twain really didn't say that. So the most important thing you can do is question what your teachers are telling you and make sure it's actually true. Um, the second thing I, I, I urge people to do is to only take advice from people who have a vested interest in them as students. Um, people will give you gratuitous ideas all the time because it's easy to give people an idea like, I would do it that way if I were you. But unless the person really cares about your welfare or is really trying to teach you, and you should ask yourself, does this person care about my welfare? Are they trying to teach me? Um, you shouldn't follow their wisdom blindly. Um, and finally, I would strongly suggest as a teacher that mercy is a much more effective teaching mechanism than justice. Um, for example, um, when I grade students, my goal is not to make sure that the student gets what they deserve, quote unquote. Uh, my goal is to make sure the student receives a grade that encourages them to learn more or follow an educational path or intellectual path, I think that would benefit them. I think far too often we lose sight of that. We're too busy separating the wheat from the chaff and promoting often the chaff rather than trying to encourage people in a positive way. I couldn't agree with you more. Tell me some tell me about your perspectives on medical education in this country because um, some of the things that uh, abound are uh, actually putting people down on rounds. Uh, professors that ask very pointed questions, and if you don't know the answer, the uh, way in which they want you to learn is through shame, and shaming them in front of others. Have you found that to be a tool that you've seen being used? And what would you say is the most effective way to teach medical students? Well, I think that culture is changing. Obviously, it's not changing fast enough. There still are the rogue doctors out there who put down their underlings, who mistreat the staff, who make inappropriate or sexist rough color remarks, but there are fewer and fewer because the cultural acceptance of them, certainly at a teaching hospital in New York, is increasingly small. Today there are things that if you said 20 years ago people would snicker, today they would suspend you. And on the whole, I think that's a good thing. But I think the major change will occur not when we teach the doctors who do that today to do it differently, but when we recruit people into the field of medicine who intuitively or by nature aren't like that. Um, it's much easier to bring kind, compassionate, worldly, humanistic people into medicine than it is to take unkind, non-humanistic, authoritarian people and make them kind and humanistic. Um, and I think part of that is reshaping, to some degree, the criteria we use to recruit, to recruit future doctors. Um, whether or not you do well in physics or organic chemistry may have some, and I, I mean a limited sum, bearing on whether or not you make a good physician. Maybe this much bearing. Um, whether or not you're a compassionate person who cares about your patients makes an enormous difference. And yet we spend very little time trying to find future physicians in the medical school or residency applicant process who are going to be compassionate at the bedside, and we spend a lot of time checking their boards for us. And I think that it's both on the one hand misguided and it's changing. I think certainly at Sinai, where they're setting up an institute for humanities and medicine, there's an increased interest in expanding the role of the broadly minded humanistic physician. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yes, it does, and very much on target. But how do we attract more humanistic people into medicine? Because medicine is still perceived as a road where one can have a certain degree of financial independence and uh, prestige. So how do we attract those humanistic people into the field? Well, I think one thing that has really changed the field very much for the better is the diversity of medicine that didn't exist 30 years ago. The very fact of having people from different cultural backgrounds, having now a majority of women in medical schools, 
narrow space available for people who are derogatory or sexist or dismissive to operate, um, as well as these new people to the field bringing their own cultural ethos that tends to be far more positive. So that, that's one factor. Um, at the same time, in order to recruit people into the field, we need to show them that medicine is far more than science. Um, there is so much emphasis on the science of medicine, and so little emphasis, particularly in the preclinical years, on the art of medicine. And we really need to focus on the artistic and creative aspect of the medical field. The great doctor is not one who knows how to read a pathophysiological chart. The great doctor is one who knows how to solve a very challenging philosophical, cultural, social problem for a patient. I'm going to pass in a minute to Adam and then to Sybil again, but I want to ask you a question about the genre that you prefer when you write. You've written plays, you've written mysteries, you have written, I don't know if you've written comedies, have you? I thought they were funny. I don't know if anybody else did. <laughs> I'm sure they were. <laughs> Do you have a proclivity or a preference for any particular genre? Oh, I, I love the short story, and that's very much... Uh, a product of the rest of the things I do in life, in the sense that if you write a novel and it goes badly, it costs you two years, three years, you have to start over again. If you write a short story and it goes badly, you've lost two weeks, a month. Um, it's very hard to write a novel at the nurse's station. It's very easy to write a short story at the nurse's station. How about plays? But you've written several plays, and, and the play has the advantage of being performed and being out in the public arena. Absolutely. Do you prefer that? Well, I, I like writing short stories more. But I think I like having written plays more. Um, beautiful young actresses never perform my short stories, so that's the added benefit. Um, but it's part of being part of a larger audience and part of a more sort of an organic being when you go to see one of your plays. And it's really a magical experience. And so in, in some sense, writing short stories is an isolating process, and writing plays is very much a group process. And that part of the latter really appeals to me. Well, you know, a lot of the Hollywood writers write uh, with a partner. Would you ever consider that? Only if it did it my way. <laughs> um, Your way or the highway, is yeah. that it? <laughs> I, I, have, I, have, I guess there probably is someone out there who I have the right mesh with that I can write well with, but on the whole, it's much easier to do things your own way, I found, sure. in a creative sense. Sure. One of the things I've been reading about recently is the, uh, uh, in North Carolina, there, been, there were one Hollywood writers who were and I, I'm sure you've, you've heard about this. Absolutely. This, this thing right now is trying to determine, trying to put an economic, I guess, a, you know, remuneration value uh, to, 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 uh, to, to try to ameliorate, if they possibly could, um, this particular, this dilemma they have. I think, I, and I don't, I don't have the numbers with me, uh, how many people were, were, were sterilized, but Yeah, well, the book to read for people more interested in this is a book by Diane Paul called Controlling Human Heredity, because there are truly thousands and thousands of these cases in the U.S. The most recent ones occurred certainly in Virginia in 1979 and probably in Indiana in 1981. So we're not talking about a lifetime ago. Um, yeah. Some of you, have, some of your audience has probably seen Judgment in Nuremberg, um, where the I think it's Maximilian Schell quotes. Uh, Quotes from the American Supreme Court and Oliver Wendell Holmes's quotation from Buck versus Bell that three generations of imbeciles is enough. That's the American Supreme Court speaking. So this is a, certainly one of the darkest moments in our history. That being said, how you compensate someone from this is one of the great ethical philosophical questions that probably will never be resolved. Because the most rational way to quote unquote make someone whole, to give them what they really deserve, would be to ask yourself, how much would you pay someone or have to pay someone in advance to, have, to get them to agree to go through this? But that logic breaks down very quickly because when you apply this to how much money would you need in advance to get paid to know that your child would be washed down a well? And the answer is people would say, no money in the world. And there's probably no amount of money in the world that many people would accept to lose the opportunity to have children, to have a family. So it's an unanswerable question. Any amount we give them, no matter how much, is not enough for them. And at some point, at the same time, it becomes too much for us. Interesting. I'm going to close by asking you about uh, transplant, uh, transplantation of organs. Do you think ethically that people should be allowed to sell their organs, kidney transplant and others? Well, the first thing I should say is um, one of the great things about organ transplant 
is we now have a laboratory of the nation, so to speak. So we can see how different countries that allow organ transplant go about it, and which programs work and which ones don't. Israel, for example, has recently pioneered a program where you can opt in or opt out of the organ donation list, but if you opt in, you get first priority if you ever need an organ, and one becomes available. Some nations in Europe, Spain, I believe, was the first of them, have a mandatory default opt-in approach, which means if you don't decide whether you want to be an organ donor or not, um, they make you an organ donor unless you opt out, um, which vastly increases the supply of organs. So I think we should be looking at other countries for different ways they've experimented in creating a larger supply of organs, which is really what concerns us as ethicists. That being said, um, I'm not particularly concerned that there is some kind of compensation system for kidneys. Um, I don't think we're, or for other organs which are resupplyable, bone marrow, for example. I think you wouldn't want a system where you had a free open market, which would mean the poor wouldn't have access at all. If the going rate for a kidney became $100,000, and an impoverished person couldn't afford it, that would be terrible. But if the government said, we're going to set $6,000 as the compensation rate for kidneys, because that's the amount of money it would cost to obtain enough kidneys to get everybody who wants to get off dialysis and can off dialysis and pay that amount out um, in a regulated way, I think that would be a very good thing. I think as long as done wisely and carefully, um, we would help more people than we would harm. I, I will add, there was a very clever man in Virginia about a decade ago now when knowing that you couldn't sell an organ, tried to rent one for 99 years. Um, and eventually the appeals court ruled you couldn't do that. But I mention that because until we have a system that allocates organs for everybody in a fair way, whether that's compensating or mandatory default opt-in, um, people will circumvent the system. They will go to Thailand, they will go to South Africa. Um, so the rich will still get organs, and the poor will still have a disadvantage. And as the New York Times ran a story several years ago, the people who sell their organs on the black market tend not to keep that money and tend to suffer significantly. So far better to have a system where it's done legally out in the open and that money is protected. Well, we just mentioned the sum of $6,000, for example. And if the government were to pay $6,000 for an organ, couldn't a poor person then sell an organ and get the $6,000? Absolutely. Okay, so there would be a market uh, but I can see a story, some kind of a, a short story that you might write, where a poor person sells one organ at a time until there's nothing left to sell. And, there, there and always, that's not going to be a comedy either. There, there's always the parable of man who swallows himself. Um, but that being said, you would regulate it in such a way. We would not let people make live heart donations. Um, there are some things that clearly a rational person would not choose. And they had a compelling reason, for example, to donate a cornea and blind yourself in one eye, we would look at that very much askance. People can live long, healthy lives with one kidney. Yes. A certain percentage of the population only has one kidney, and they don't know it um, until they get some incidental right. scan. So that being said, the, the risks are probably far fewer than the benefits of having whatever amount of money the government would offer you as an indigent person. Right. Well, I'm gonna, I want to thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Appel. Dr. Appel Esquire, and uh, we really appreciate your sharing your brilliant thoughts and insights with us, and uh, we uh, congratulate you on not only all the degrees that you've won, but on your career trajectory, and I know it's helping so many people in the city of New York and really indeed around the nation, so thank you for coming here to share your insights with us today. Thank you. I'm glad to, I'm glad to be here. It's great.